We're going to pick up the reading in verse 32. Verse 32 of John chapter 8. Still hear pages turning. Wonderful, wonderful. Glad you still carry your Bible to church. Chapter 8, verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. Now stop right there and think about what they just said. They were under the control of Rome at that very moment. At that very moment. So I'm not sure uh, whether they were just blinded to the reality or whether they were being totally dishonest. I don't know who answered that, but it says, How sayest thou ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Listen, verily, verily. And that's what that means. When you see that verily, verily, you need to pay attention. He's telling you something here. I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. And that glorious chapter 8, verse 36, if the son, with a capital S, Therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Glorious freedom, we sang about it this morning, didn't we? Freedom from sin, what a privilege this morning. Father, we thank you today for this wonderful congregation that's gathered here, and Lord, they did it voluntarily, no one made them come. And we appreciate and are honored by their presence this morning. We thank God for them. We ask you to minister to our hearts today, minister to our souls this morning hour as we look into your word, as we try to find truth that will transform our lives, that will change our culture, that will affect our society, Lord, some way, O oh God. Let thy word go out and let it not return void, but let it prosper where you send it this morning, and we'll praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we were invited over for the, the church family firework display last night, but neither one of us were physically up to it. It had been a long two or three days, like I say, catching up with the mowing here, and then uh, we put up some corn, and we've, uh, we've done some other things, and just kind of the old body just said at 9.30, I said, I, <laughs> I just don't have the sap to go uh, uh, over to the fireworks. But you know, the Lord sent a fireworks display here in this little area. All four sides of this place was lit up last night for must have been two hours. I'd like to have the money that they shot up in the air last night. I'd like to have that. I could take another vacation. But I mean, there were fireworks on that side of the house. There were fireworks on that side. Over every direction I looked, there were fireworks. And I mean, nice big explosions. And it was so beautiful. And I hope that people were celebrating the freedom. I hope that's what it was all about. And friend, I, I'm so thankful this morning again. And I want to say it again. I am so glad to be born an American. I have had a wonderfully good life because of being born in America. I've never had to drink water out of the sewer. I've never had to dig food out of a trash dumpster. I tell you, God has been so good to me. Now, I couldn't help where I was born, could you? Did you choose where you were going to be born? No, you didn't. You didn't choose what color skin your parents had. You didn't choose that. But here we are this morning. We are born in America and we've had a tremendously blessed life and blessed, uh, comfortable situation because of that. And I'm so glad for that freedom this morning. I don't take it for granted either. I see there's forces at work diligently and, and, and tremendously at work this very hour to try to undermine what we as a nation are all about. And that's, that's concerning, isn't it? And we hear protests and we see people marching and we see places being burned down and police departments being disbanded. We see all kinds of things in the news this morning that tell us that America is in dire trouble. 
Our nation, I, I almost put it on the marquee out there. I went ahead with something benign, uh, like Happy Birthday America. But I really wanted to put born, USA born, July 4th, 1776, died. Will it be 2020? 2021? When the republic is crumbled? Friends, I'm serious with you this morning. Our freedom in America is jeopardized tremendously. And you know that. And that's not the, the crux of my message this morning, but we have individuals that are, that are protesting, and, and I want you to know that the, the protest uh, might have started over a black man's death, but they've been hijacked by Marxist organizations that are well-funded and well-paid for, and the Black Lives Matter is no longer about black lives if it ever was. And so we're, we're living in days where people are being used and circumstances are being used and the issue of slavery is brought up time and again and even talking about restitution and payment back for slavery. Well, there hasn't been any slaves for over 100 years. And, uh, so, you know, there's, uh, there's, uh, uh, you'd have to go back and dig them up. But uh, we're not going to do that and I hope America doesn't bow to that. But uh, officially, officially, Slavery was disbanded in America after the Civil War. But slavery still exists in America. Rampant slavery exists in America. Let me give you three things this morning very quickly just to illustrate uh, this matter of, and also a warning, but the, the biggest slavery ring in the world right now is labeled as human trafficking. Human trafficking. You know what that is? That's where people kidnap or steal other individuals and they sell them into some form of slavery. Most of the time it's a sexual exploitation. And uh, we have a few teenagers here this morning. Let me just give you five cents worth of advice Pay close attention to your surroundings. Always be aware of your surroundings. If you can avoid it, never be alone, ladies, in town. If you can avoid it, never be alone. So, Brother Halfway, what's the extent? There were over 23,000 human trafficking victims the last year I could come up with the statistic was in 2018. 23,000 people were taken into captivity. 71% of those were female and 29% were males. They estimate that the global profits from human trafficking is over $150 billion a year. $150 billion a year. These people, this is organized. This, uh, like, like all other forms of crime and, and the things that are going on in our culture, it's not random. It's not me being mad at you and I steal your kid and sell it. That's not usually the case. These, there are people that are looking for victims. There are people that are uh, they're, they're just uh, circling the community and many of them are circling the internet and there's a big warning there. A big, big warning. People are so gullible in our day as to, to meet someone on the internet who claims to be somebody and then blindly go and meet them in another city or in another place, not ever meeting them, having no background whatsoever except what they post. And it may not even be their picture. Friend, we need to beware. We need to stay away from individuals that you don't know. And especially solicitations to meet someone you don't know. Don't be so foolish. Don't be so foolish. But $150 billion in profit and $99 billion of it, they said, come from the sexual exploitation of boys and girls sold into the slavery and prostitution. You know, this is a horrible thing. And you can find many, many testimonies of people that have gotten out. And you can hear real life stories of individuals who were in that situation. They were victims of human trafficking. And by the mercies of God, they were able to get out before it killed them. 
But some of their lives were absolutely, absolutely, it was a horrible thing. Some of the most awful suffering and stories that I've ever read about or heard about, friend, happens right here in America today. And it's not just America, but it's all over the world. In South Carolina in 2018, there were 848 victims in South Carolina of human trafficking. Nearly 1,000 people, near, nearly 1,000 young people were taken captive and made slaves to somebody to do horrible things and to be mistreated horribly. And I thought, well, the most of it would be down on the coast, those big cities down there, you know, and Columbia and Greenville. Most of the red dots for South Carolina were in the northwestern corner of the state. Not too far from here. We need to beware. Slavery still does exist. Second form of slavery that exists today is the slavery of, uh, of addiction. Addiction. 21 million Americans have at least one Addiction. Drug overdose deaths have more than tripled since 1990. From 1999 to 2017, 700,000 people died of a drug overdose. 700,000 people died in that time frame, in that 18-year period. 700,000. It says that the drug addiction cost the U.S. economy $600 billion annually. Nine hundred and ninety-two thousand teenagers have been diagnosed with drug abuse disorder. Nine hundred and ninety-two thousand. One in twenty-five of our teenagers. Five point one million between the ages of eighteen and twenty-five have a drug addiction. That's one in seven, or fifteen percent of our population in the early adulthood already are addicted, already are slaves to the drug or alcohol abuse. That is, that is frightening figures because they have become the servants of that. It controls many of their choices. Many of their life's choices are controlled by the, the craving and the appetite that that drug has produced within their body. Friend, they are certainly slaves to those things. And then the third category that kind of surprised me a little bit, in America at least, I didn't think it, I'd never really thought it was a problem. I've heard of it and read of it over in the Middle East where it's very prominent. But the taking of children and, and, and planning marriages for children as young as 10 years old, girls as young as 10, are put into forced marriages. They call them child brides. And I thought, my, you know, that's certainly not happening in America, but then I began to do a little research, and between 2000 and 2015, 10,000 married, 10,000 young people were married under the age of 15. When I'm pretty sure that almost all the state's legal marriage age is 18. How does that happen? How does that happen in America? When it says that uh, 10,000 minors were married at 15 or younger. But in the top six countries in the Middle East, 30 million child marriages of girls under 15. They're just babies. They're just children. And yet they're given to some person usually 20, 30, 40 years older than them. They're actually sold into these marriages. Now there's a, there's a lot of movements at work to try to curb some of this and all of this today. There's, there's many organizations that are fighting drug and alcohol addiction. There's people that are out there fighting the trafficking industry. There's people that are trying to, to try to curtail that. And there's even people in America that are fighting this, uh, this matter of being sold as a child bride or being married at such a young age when you're not really mature enough to make that decision. It might have been consensual uh, in a sense here in America. Those those young girls and young boys might have, might have agreed to be married. 
But they in no right, they in no way were ready to make that decision. And many times they find themselves in situations far worse than they were at home <coughs> under their parents. But slavery still exists. But you know, the most prevalent form of slavery is what Jesus told us right here. Chapter 8, verse 34. He says, he that committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now, if you look that word up in Strong's, the answer and the definition is going to be slave. You look it up in Thayer's Greek Dictionary. And if you find that word in that verse, servant, he says it means slave. Jesus saying, whosoever committeth sin is the slave of sin. You're under its control. You're under its dominance. It's doing the controlling and you're doing the following. You know, that's a pitiful situation. But it is so pandemic, to use a popular term. Sin is pandemic. It's permeated our culture. It's permeating our atmosphere. It's permeating our society today. Violence, hatred, murder, rape. You, you just go down the long list of crimes and sin, of arson and, and thievery. Oh, everything that the Bible teaches us that is wrong for mankind. It's prevalent in our society. It's a pandemic. Sin is on a great uh, rampage in our, in our world today. And it's making slaves out of people. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, Know ye not that to whom you yield your servants, members to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. You realize that who you yield your life and your talents and your, your hands and your mouth and your feet, if you're yielding that to sin, you're the servant or slave of sin. You become the, the pawn. You become the one who's being manipulated, the one who's being directed. The old cliche that was back there in the 70s or 80s, sin made me do it. Sin made me do it, or the devil made me do it. There's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of truth in that because the devil wants to control. He desires to control you. He desires to direct your life so that he can further his agenda, which is getting back at God, which is hindering people that want to mind God. The devil is constantly at work this morning trying to intervene in the lives of human beings. It's just like when Jesus told Peter that night, right before his betrayal, right before he was caught that night and taken into custody, he told Peter, Satan hath desired thee, Peter. Satan desires you. And for what good purpose? No good purpose. He has desired you so that he can sift you like wheat. He can grind you into fine powder. Friend, the devil has no good intention for any of you this morning. And if you're yielding your members unto unrighteousness, if you're yielding your heart or mind or body into sin, you're giving yourself over to the devil to use you. And you become his slave. There's, there's degrees of that, I understand. There's, there's the degrees that, uh, in some sense, there's sinners who are not as bad as others, and then there are sinners who have given themselves to more vile passions and work. But then there's those who have given themselves so fully to the devil that the devils and demons actually possess that individual. You said, that just happened in Bible times. No, it doesn't. It's very prevalent today. It's becoming more prevalent in America because the gospel light is getting dim. The power within the churches are going dim and weak. Friend, we don't realize this morning how many demonic people are right around us in this community and in our state and in our country. We don't realize how many people are actually controlled by evil spirits. Now, you know, you go from a good sinner, and I'm just using terms to make identity, there's no such thing as a good sinner. 
There's no such thing as a small sinner. Friend, if we give ourselves to sin, we become the servant of that sin. But we realize that some people do far worse than others. And some people go farther in this matter of evil than others. And the farther you go, the tighter the chains. The farther you go, the, the tighter the bondage. The farther you go, the harder it is to get out. I'm trying to warn us this morning that sin is a hard taskmaster. Satan is a slave owner. He's a slave driver. And yet people think, oh, I'm having so much fun. I heard of some people just a few days ago had a party. They added alcohol to their party. And I heard that some of them passed out in the yard. And please excuse me for being so plain, but some of them regurgitated. They vomited all over themselves. They got so drunk, having a great time. Sin is so much fun. You don't know where you are, you don't know who you are, and you're so stinking drunk, you're puking all over yourself. That's a blast, isn't it? Well, one of the same people that was at the party couldn't go to work for the next two days. Felt so bad. I wonder if I could speak to them. I'd say, are we having fun yet? Sin's a blast, isn't it? We're having a ball. Well, there's a few moments in that process where there's a high and there's a euphoric feeling, but friend, that passes into something that's far worse. Sin doesn't end well. And drugs and alcohol don't end well. For anyone, there is no practical purpose in, under God's heaven for you to get drunk. How many people are killed on the highways because the driver of a vehicle was drunk and many times they live through it. And there's some innocent family that loses a loved one or two or three or five because the drunk driver was on the road. Friend, the church used to preach against drinking. We still do. We still do. Alcohol is a curse. The liquor industry is a curse to America today. It's ruined so many lives. But now the, the fad is turned in some degree against and away from the alcohol, although there's a still a horrendous alcohol problem in America, but it's turned to these cheap synthetic drugs that individuals who can take just one hit of some of this nonsense and become addicted after one single dose. Young people stay a million miles from the alcohol and the drug scene. It's nothing but a one-way street to destruction. It's nothing but a one-way street to slavery and bondage and a life of hardship. I grew up around it. My father was an alcoholic for 30 years of his life. But I'm glad the story didn't end there, thank God. He saw the one who could set him free. He met the man that could set him free, and he did set him free. And for the next 30 some years of his life, he lived sober. And he lived it in church, and he lived it serving God. And thank God for the change that Jesus can make. But friend, during that 30 years, he told me, I've started over three times. Lost everything he had, started over three times. I can tell you illustration after illustration of people who have had great careers going, great, uh, great money-making opportunities were going big guns until they started dabbling in the drugs and the alcohol. It affects you, friends. It affects you in a, such a negative way. Not only physically does it impair your senses and weaken your morals, but, friend, it impairs you from uh, your responsibilities and doing those things that are right. It gets a hold of people. It takes control of them. They don't know when to quit. They can't quit sometimes after a certain point. You know, drugs are an awful thing and alcohol is an awful thing. It's an awful slavery. But I'm so glad this morning that Jesus Christ has a remedy to free the slaves. You could take 
Chapter 8, verse 36, as your emancipation proclamation. You could take that and you could say, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now John started this chapter, or at least where the chapter division started in this chapter, was talking about the woman caught in adultery. And they had brought her in embarrassed, excruciatingly embarrassed, before these people in the public setting and before Jesus and wanted to know what he wanted to do with her. Now, I don't know why she was in that situation to start with, except sin. Sin. She was in that act of adultery because she was breaking God's law. She was a sinner. Whether she was bought as a prostitute, whether she was lured in by someone who told her they loved her, I don't know what it was that brought her into that act of immorality, but something brought her to that point, and the setup was set up with the man, no doubt, that they were going to catch this woman because they wanted to trap Jesus. They didn't care necessarily, I don't think, that she was guilty of this act, but they wanted to trap Jesus and find some way to accuse him. But Jesus, <laughs> he's a hard one to trap. I mean to tell you, if you want to trap somebody, you don't want to pick on Jesus. They sent men from the Sanhedrin that were good at it, experts at it. They went and listened to his words and went back to the Sanhedrin without him. Where's he at? We couldn't get him. You know what they said? No man ever spake like that man. They were awed by the words of Jesus Christ. Though they came to catch him in his words, they came to trap him so the Sanhedrin could condemn him. But the guys that were sent to trap him come back with the praise note. You've never heard anybody talk like he talks. You've never heard anybody speak like he speaks. But friend, these men tried to trap Jesus with this adulterous situation. He stoops down on the ground, begins to scratch in the dirt. They said, well, what are you going to do with her? Moses said to stone her, what are you going to do? Let the ones that's without sin cast the first stone, he said. Amen. And then one by one, their conscience began to show them things that they were guilty of. And one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they slipped out the back door. Jesus looked up from scratching on the ground, and there wasn't anyone there but him and her. She said, he said, woman, where are thine accusers? They all left, Lord. Neither do I condemn thee to death, but go and sin no. Did Jesus preach a sinless religion? Did Jesus preach a deliverance from sin? Yes, he did. He would not ask you to do something that was impossible for you to do. But by his grace and by his transforming power, the Christ of God can set us free from sin. The bondage, the slavery, the guilt, the consequences, the pain. The Hebrew writer says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation. And the Lord gave me a message down at the rescue mission for those men. And the thought and the avenue that the Lord gave me for those men in that text, how shall we escape? How shall we escape the pain of sin? How shall we escape the separation that sin causes in your families? And I went down the line of all the, the things that sin does to us. How are you going to escape that unless you run to Jesus? You're not. You're not going to escape it. It's inescapable. And then you find the judgment of God and the guilt and condemnation that is incurred when we sin against God. Friend, let me tell you, it's a horrible thing to be under that cloud of guilt and sin. But thanks be to God today, there's good news there is an emancipator. There is a proclamation that you can have life and you can have it more abundantly and you can yield your members as servants to righteousness unto holiness and God can give you grace to live for him. Isn't that good news? God can lift us out of the deep miry clay and set our feet on the solid rock to stay. Hallelujah this morning. 
church, we have a great Savior. We have a great salvation. Amen. I don't know how many of you ever met or heard Re Brother Raymond Rice. Brother Newton, did you ever meet Brother Rice? An old drunkard, an old drunkard. And he sang a song. And he, he, I can't sing it, and I, I wouldn't do you that way if I could. But uh, he, he talked about coming down the lane to an old white house. Said there was cardboard over the windows. He said, Jesus put glass in my windows. He said, children running from a drunken daddy coming home. He said, Jesus put love in our house. I want to tell you there's a change that takes place when Jesus passes by. There's an emancipation, friend. Now, I think that everybody that gets saved does better financially after they get saved. <laughs> I know I was way in debt when I got saved. Jesus has helped me to get out of debt. Praise God. Amen. Jesus makes us better, but he betters our life in so many different ways. It's absolutely amazing the freedom that is ours. The freedom to do what's right. The freedom to want to do right. The freedom to enjoy the things that are good and turn your back on the things that are evil. I'm so glad that Jesus Christ is able to free our souls and our minds and our bodies, even if you had addictions. Oh, I've seen my daddy. I can tell you what. My daddy is the big, one of the biggest testimonies in my life about deliverance from addiction. Because I begged him as a boy as we'd close the bar room at one o'clock in the morning and I rode home in that old green Chevy pickup many a night with a drunken daddy hoping we could make it home. Oh, friend, and I looked at him one night in that truck or one morning about 1 a.m. as a boy about 12 years of age and I said, Daddy, why don't you quit drinking? Through blurred eyes, friend, he looked over at me in that truck and with the sincerity that I don't know I ever heard him any more sincere in all of his life, he said, Son, I can't. Son, I can't. He was honest that night. He couldn't, friend. But one Saturday night in April of 1978, a revival meeting in a little country church like this, and the glory of God came upon the service, and people were praying for my daddy, and he was drunk on that night. He was drunk, friend. And when his wife went home, and she found him there wallowing on the floor, screaming and agonizing, under deep conviction for sin, but still drunken, she called the pastor and the evangelist to come down. She said, Ernest has lost his mind. Y'all come down and pray for him. Well, he was about to lose the old mind that night. So they went down and prayed with my daddy till Jesus sobered him up. My daddy repented of his sin that night, friend. And I tell you the truth, he never had another drink of alcohol for the next years that he lived, 30 some years after that that he lived for God. I'm telling you, Jesus set him free. He broke the chains that he couldn't break. God is powerful today. Jesus said you can know the truth and the truth will make you free. And if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. The next morning, no hangover. No headache. Goes out to the same old Chevy pickup. Took six fifths of Gilby's hundred proof vodka and poured it in the little stream that ran down beside his house. He said, I got ever men in that creek drunk that morning. <laughs> that was my daddy's testimony. He said, I got ever men in that creek drunk. But with the emptying of those six fifths, and if you don't if you don't know what hundred proof liquor is, it's fifty percent alcohol. Fifty percent alcohol. I know I don't know if the other fifty percent is water or what, but the fifty percent is alcohol, pure fifty percent alcohol. But my daddy broke those things in the stream and never looked back. I know Jesus can liberate this morning. I have seen it work. He's the reason. No doubt that when I was invited by him to that fall revival of the same year, my daddy invited. We had seen a change in his life. The cussing, mean. Man that I grew up as a boy knowing, I admired my dad in so many ways. He was a brute of a man, strong as an ox. He, he was just a brute of a man, but I watched the alcohol and I watched when he didn't eat properly and all the years he slept in his pickup truck and things that, that a drunk suffers through. 
I saw him come home one day, and the, the next morning when I saw him, he had come out of a ballroom one night, and some man, an enemy of his, had hit him right square in the face with a two-by-four board right across his nose and face. I never seen a worse looking individual in my life. He was blue and black and swollen for days and days and days. Sin's a lot of fun, young people. Let me tell you, sin's a lot of fun. It was something. But I've seen that side of the story. I've seen the heartache of sin. One of my next door neighbors, his first name was Danny. I saw him on the streets of Anna Walt, West Virginia one afternoon. I saw him laying on the street. I went over to him. He had gone into DTs. That's short for delirium tremens. That's what alcoholics get when they can't get alcohol. And during DTs, one of the dangers of that is they'll choke to death on their own tongue. They try to swallow their own tongue. I literally had to reach in the man's mouth and grab his tongue to keep from him choking to death. Are we having fun yet? Are we having fun yet? Does a drink sound good to you? Friend, it starts with a social drinking. It starts with a little bit. It starts with sampling some, some mild drugs. But it leads on and on and on to a life of bondage and slavery that it'll take the very power of God to set you free from. That young boy went to an early grave. Lots of others of my friends that I grew up went to an early grave. Some of them are in wheelchairs the rest of their life because they were in drunken automobile accidents. I'm trying to tell you something this morning. Stay away from it. I don't care who offers it. I don't care who's doing it. Drugs and alcohol are tools of the devil to create slavery out of good people. But Jesus has a freedom for you. Jesus Christ let that woman go free. He let her off the hook. He'll let you off the hook. He'll forgive you your trespasses. Say, so, well, I've never done anything that bad. Thank God. Thank God you haven't. But if you've lied, taken something that didn't belong to you, Taken the Lord's name in vain? Broken the Sabbath? Coveted someone else's property? You don't have to be a murderer to go to hell. Sin is the world's greatest slavery. Jesus is the only emancipator from sin. I've seen people quit drinking on their own. And I admire that kind of determination. But I've never seen anybody get saved on their own. I'm yet to meet the man or the woman that said, I, I saved myself. I'm ready for heaven because I saved myself. I didn't need Jesus. Friend, you're very deluded if you believe that. Jesus is the only way. And for most people... He's the only way out of these bondages. I wonder this morning, are you free? Are you going to be like the Jews said, ah, oh, we've never been in bondage to anybody. I can't tell you how many drunks I've heard say, I can quit anytime I want to. They'll say that in the midst of being drunk at the moment. I can quit anytime I want to, preacher. I can, preacher. Let me show you something. And they'll stagger around. I said, well, go ahead and prove it to me. Same thing with tobacco habits and addictions. There's so many out there. And the way to not be addicted is never, never give in to the first. You'll never have a problem with that addiction, but you still got the sin problem until you come to Jesus. Let's stand this morning. Are you free in the sense that the Son has made you free? Are you made free this morning? Is there anyone this morning that'd like to come and talk to the Lord?